said, she said, they said, we said, to amplify controversies that don't really exist. Now, they may have clinically diagnosed attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Brace yourself for a heart-pounding journey as Andrew Huberman unveils the secrets of social media detox 101, a transformative expedition that will liberate your mind, free your spirit, and restore your soul from the clutches of the digital abyss. I, look, I, I use social media. I love social media. One of the issues with social media, however, is first of all, let's think about the format it arrives in. Let's forget the content, violent, political, happy, sad, bullying, non-bullying. Let's just forget the content and just pretend that we were looking into a box about this big. Prepare to break free from the chains of virtual captivity as Huberman's powerful revelations unravel the insidious grip of social media, revealing a path to liberation, self-discovery, and a renewed connection with the world that lies beyond the screen. Now think about an opposite situation. You go to the doctor's office and you're sitting in the doctor's lobby and you're waiting and you're waiting and there's no phone reception so you can't scroll Instagram. You're waiting and you're waiting. It's incredibly boring. It's a very low dopamine state. Enter a realm where disconnection becomes the ultimate connection as Huberman's battle-tested strategies ignite a revolution within, empowering you to reclaim your time, your attention, and your sanity from the relentless onslaught of social media's seductive grasp. Yeah, on the time scale of 24 hours, one of the, the huge mistakes that we all make, and I'm, I've said this many times, so if, uh, if people have heard me say this before, forgive me, but it turns out it's still true. Uh, getting too much bright light exposure from the hours of 10 p.m. until 4 a.m., unless you have to work shift work, which is a unique case, that bright light exposure between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., even if you adjust the colors of the lights, you still need to get everything really, really dim Prepare to witness a phoenix-like rebirth as Huberman's masterful guidance empowers you to detach from the virtual world, igniting a profound metamorphosis within, and awakening a newfound sense of purpose, clarity, and inner peace that can only be found outside the confines of the digital realm. Just how triggering are our phones when it comes to dopamine? Okay, great question. Uh, we often hear that, you know, that social media getting dopamine hit after dopamine hit. When we first get on social media after a long, for the first time or after a long period of time, the amount of dopamine that's released we think is quite substantial. As Huberman's dramatic revelations about the social media detox 101 journey unfold, be prepared to embark on a heroic quest, navigating the treacherous waters of digital distraction, reclaiming your identity, and rediscovering the essence of your true self amidst a sea of virtual noise. So I'll drink mate starting about 90 minutes after I'm awake. And then that's kind of my morning. But after the walk, I go inside. I, I do try to avoid social media at that point. Maybe a quick check of 10 minutes. I set, I'll even set an alarm. Um, and then- on a, on a phone or a computer? Typically on a phone. I'd like to move more to the computer, but I'm in transit a lot these days. And um, it, you have to uh, be thoughtful, obviously. but. I think maybe 10 minutes on social media, but I want social media to continue to be a pleasure and because of the dopamine system and we can talk about that. I don't want to get, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of someone else's um, psychology or neurology. Um, I want to stay in my own frame. The, the orientation I have in the early part of the day with that notebook is I want to be in my own mental frame. I've just slept. During sleep is when we have neuroplasticity. The actual rewiring of neural connections occurs during sleep. I'm a big believer in the subconscious. And you're, when you wake up, you are now in a position to extract whatever it is that these new neural circuits have, have figured out about the previous day and day's events. I think that if you look at any drug of abuse or any situation where somebody isn't motivated or thinks that now, they may have clinically diagnosed attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but a lot of what people think is ADHD, it turns out, is people just over-consuming dopamine from various sources. And then, and also the context within a, a TikTok feed is the context switch is insane. The brain has never seen, first of all, this is the first time in human evolution that we wrote with our thumbs, but that's a pretty benign shift. And then the other shift is normally you walk from one room to another or from a field into the trees or from a hut into, or a house or whatever it is. But now you can get 10,000 context switches in that 30 minutes of scrolling on Instagram or TikTok. And so it's all about self-regulation. We are going to select for the people that can self-regulate. And 
so then people say, well, how do you self-regulate? How do kids self-regulate? Well, this is my hope and one of the reasons I've gotten excited about public education and teaching neuroscience is that this is a place where knowledge of knowledge actually can allow oneself to intervene. When you think, I'm feeling low, I don't feel good, nothing really feels like good, am I depressed? Maybe, but maybe you're just, you've saturated the dopamine circuits, you're now in the pain part of things, what do you do? Well, you have to stop, you need, you need to replenish dopamine, you need to stop engaging with this behavior, and then your pleasure for it will come back. But you have to constantly control the hinge, it's not just about being back and forth on the seesaw, you have to make sure the hinge doesn't get stuck in pain or in pleasure. So one of the fun things about social media that probably drives my science colleagues crazy is like, for instance, there's this really um, brilliant researcher up in uh, Scandinavia, Susanna Soberg, who's done a lot on deliberate cold exposure and mm -hmm. deliberate heat, its effects on metabolism and a bunch of other things. And uh, she's come up with these protocols that are in peer reviewed journals. And if you parse these papers, you come up with a number of different things that are really useful. And so I just started naming these things like the Soberg effect, and, you, know, <laughs> you know, but when, as soon as uh, scientists get uh, ruffled about this, you can just um, turn it back on them and say, well, in the fields of science, how is it that something actually becomes designated in effect? And it's the same way people designate. Well, this is the problem. We remember the rat experiment. They are effectively the rat with no dopamine but they can still achieve some sense of pleasure by consuming excess calories, by consuming social media. And look, I'm not judging, I do this stuff too, right? Scrolling social media. If you've ever scrolled social media and you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It doesn't really feel that good. And I can remember a time where you'd see something, it was just so cool, or you'd see something online. I remember this when TED Talks first came out. I was like, this is amazing. Mm. These are some, you know, at least some of them are really smart people sharing really cool insights. And then now that there are like a gazillion TED Talks, I remember spending a winter in my office at when I was a junior professor, cleaning my office finally, and binging TED Talks in the background, thinking this is a good use of my time. Pretty soon, they all sucked to me. <laughs> I was like, this isn't good. So what you need to do is stop watching TED Talks for a while, wait, and then they become interesting again. And that's this pain-pleasure balance. And so for people that aren't feeling motivated, the problem is they're not motivated, but they're getting just enough or excess sustenance so they're getting the little mild hits of opioid, it becomes an opioid system. And if you think about the opioid drugs as opposed to dopaminergic, dopaminergic drugs make people rabid for everything. You know, so of abuse like cocaine and amphetamine make people incredibly outward directed, right? They hardly notice anything except what they want more of, more, 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 more. It's very, it's bad because those trigger so much dopamine release that they become the reward. It's very circular, the only the can give that much dopamine, nothing they could pursue would give them as much dopamine as the drug itself. So there's that, and then there's the kind of opioid-like effects of constantly indulging oneself with social media or with video games or with, uh, with food or with anything to the point where it no longer evokes the motivation and craving. And this is really the new evolution of the understanding of, of dopamine in, neuro, in neuroscience, which is that dopamine itself is not the reward. It's the buildup to the reward. So the biggest issue I have, the, the, the mess that I see out there that I hope will get resolved is that people are using social media and uh, a certain type of uh, he said, she said, they said, we said to amplify controversies that don't really exist, right? I'm willing to bet, for instance, I'll just state my stance on this, that eating more plants and less meat Forgive me, Paul Saladino, he's a friend of mine and you know he's the carnivore MD. He's got great data to support what he's got, but I like plants. I'm gonna eat a salad. Am I gonna die? Maybe, but I'm eating my salad. But I'm also gonna eat a steak. And so it's almost like crazy when we start talking about this, like, are we really talking about this?